Thank you so much, Nick, for having a chat with me about complex issues. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. Yeah. Now, my first response to a design, if when I'm called in to consult, is to look at where the losses are on a site and try to plug the losses, not completely so that it floods the site, but sufficiently so that the site is not losing nutrients and losing water that it may need. So I guess you identify the needs of the site somewhat and then you I go about plugging the losses, losses of nutrients, water and organic matter that can flow away from the site. What do you think about that approach? Yeah, you're right. It's kind of a leaky plug. Mm. And if you've got your students coming onto a fresh site, it's probably degraded. There's too fast movement that water will be um, moving over too fast and it will be carrying with it soil and you'll see erosion. Lee Davison was a teacher of mine. He's a, this amazing wastewater guru from Lismore Uni and he had the 80-20 rule mm -hmm. where he said you can do 80% of the, the job with 20% of the resources. Yeah. And and plugging, leaky plugging the big leaks is a classic example of that. And you can often just put stuff in the way to slow things down. And um, Peter Andrews, a controversial figure, that was what he did. He, he'd have this, this water system, this creek, and it would be dry, but then it would kind of flood, but briefly, and then dry out again. And he would just put stuff in the way, logs and plants, and he didn't care if they were weeds or whatever, rocks, and and slow things down. That's, that is a leaky plug. Mm. And in Keyline, they use flags or a type of flag where you could flood an area in that flood irrigation technique. They would flood an area with a flag and then you can just remove the flag. But that takes a bit of management, right? Um, that's all quite sophisticated earthworks and, and careful levelling and stuff. And, and so for... For students who want to just get started, mm. that's something that they can do is they, they can recognise where where is their erosion, where can you see soil, get, are there bare spots, that's unnatural and, and nature is trying to convert this place into a thicker covered land and so you can just help it along by plugging the the leaks putting stuff in the way whether it's a pile of mulch or rocks or logs or whatever so what about if there was a sudden destructive downfall and you've got this lovely little system how does that affect your your leaky plug well i like to think of slow flow and fast flow yeah a, a good leaky plug will operate under all different flow regimes. Mm -hmm. and, um, the Brewarrina fish traps mm. are like that, that from, from what I've seen, um, you can make a trap with any, any type of flow. So there's this, the center, when you've got low flow, there's, there's little traps there. And then when you've got more flood conditions there, that's all completely covered, but doesn't wash away. Mm -hmm. And then there's this sort of higher ground where you, that like, it's also shaped for traps. Mm -hmm. And and that kind of thinking would be amazing with our water management. And so I get, I'm, I deliberately make pipes leak mm -hmm. in certain situations. So, um, when you've got this gentle flow, most of what is coming through is going to drip out of the pipe and into, say, a garden bed. Mm -hmm. When you've got like full on flood flow, you, you, most of that water is going to get carried through the pipe. And mm -hmm. if you're arranging, um, say, logs in to support soil, you don't want to make a, a barrier. 
I think Bill Mollison said, when you, if you put a, a barrier in the way of flow, it will, it will break. Mm. So there's a, a bit of technique into, in mm. um, how do you make this leaky plug um, do its job without being destroyed in, in the peak times. And, and often you, you angle, um, say if you put in a log in the way of a, of a, um, of a water flow, you'll angle it. Yep. So the slow, my hands probably aren't making much sense in this diagram, but um, slow flow will nestle up against the log and, and just yep. slowly kind of um, pass, pass across. And, and when, when water slows, it, it drops silt. And you'll get this this build up of soil against the surface, but when it's like really full on, you you're not blocking the flow, and water can can keep keep going. Right. That's just a real basic example. But if you're setting up your garden, there'll be hundreds of different applications of how can I hold hold this soil together while the plants are um, establishing. Because ultimately, plants are the are the the masters of of this dilemma. Mm. Um, I was talking of uh, um, Lee Davison before. He went to all these stormwater drains and where they were just smooth concrete, and that they were polluting the the ocean because everything was going in the drain, yeah. and like all car oil and all sorts of stuff, and they're just going straight into the into the sea. And so they deliberately planted reeds in the in the base of these big concrete drains. And during slow flow, the reeds would just filter out all of the, the particles and they'd sit there and, and, they, and the reeds would hold this together and gradually build the floor of the, the concrete drain. But then when you've got full on flood, the reeds just lie down and cover that soil and and protect themselves so we've got these allies out there mm. fantastic great idea so would you have as the second goal of design mm. to optimize the resources would i think that's a great point because it that they, they, it's tempting to keep expanding and get excited about new projects and I find that as as I age as a gardener I'm optimizing that I'm, I'm looking at what I've set up and I'm not happy with its level of optimization and and I'm I just want to get something really working well rather than three quarters of the way there and then then getting excited about some other new horizon so so can you give me an example of something that's not working at, to its full potential and how you would bring it up to its full i think zone one mm -hmm. and one and two that you can you can really load that up with productivity if you stick at it rather than kind of getting it okay and then going off for an expanding it, it it can be a bit of a curse having a lot of space because mm -hmm. you tend to want to use it there is that eco village model where they think people only need 750 to 800 meters square for their personal zone one yeah and then you have communal zone two and three four and five and six or whatever it is well, it depends on the climate, doesn't it? Maybe how much space and, one needs, and how and how busy you are. And communities are great because you don't have to try to replicate everything individually. And I do see a lot of permaculture gardens that aren't well optimized in in zone one and two, mine included, unless they're forced to. Mm. by the lack of space mm. okay so what would the optimized zone one look like it would be really productive per square meter okay 
Excellent. Thank you. So I wondered if the third goal of our design would be to harmonize. Hmm. Well, what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, <laughs> been quite on quite a journey, as I told you, with yeah. what is design and what are we trying to achieve and how much control do we want to exercise? Permaculture is about creating a habitat for humanity, one where we can live sustainably, truly sustainably with nature. And then the permaculture living skill, skills are the habits that we develop in order for us to work in this and to survive and contribute to the habitat. What is your view of what we're trying to achieve? Well, I used to think it was technical and design based and I did it, for, I did permaculture for political reasons, that it was my way of, of rejecting this big picture mm. problem, but I didn't realise that it would make me happy, that I, I like mucking around in the soil and and having the birds come in and enjoy my garden and drinking the rainwater that I collected. So for me, that's that's harmonizing because all the nature and the special little environment that I'm creating and me, that we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. So with some systems thinking that groups that I'm in at the moment, with Carol Sanford, um, she's a disruptor, proud disruptor of systems thinking. She talks about things, allowing things to emerge and then identifying those things that align with our goals and supporting those things that align with the goals. But unless I'm really clear about what my goals are, yeah, I mean, but deep down, of course, I have ethics, which sort of inform my goals. And so my ethics are to try to do things without any poisons and try less to impose and but to look and observe. And then tr and that's my way of harmonising is to try to do things without trashing stuff and and try to support things that are emerging, that are doing well and try to lessen the damage of other things that are not so supportive to nature. But what brings us to design and not just have nature take over? So why do we design in the first place? Well, depends how much because... The Gumbangi people influenced this this land in in how they burnt and and they create kind of pockets for all different organisms. So there's a I, look. I don't know if I'm taking liberties here, but uh, I don't want to misappropriate anything. But there's a story from near here, and it, it's basically that the, the moral of the story is that tiny little bird, the partilode is really important to people. And that tells me that, hey, keep the, the thickets, keep the, the dense habitat. It's, it's easy to overclear that there, were, I'm pretty sure there were um, landscapes here that were rather park-like and that's great for wallabies and, and that. But if it's too park-like, you're gonna lose those small birds. And that's, that's a guiding principle for me here is what whatever I do and I've I've created some park-like landscape for, for bushfire reasons but I'm, I'm keeping things thick in places and and protected so every everything is important now um I can't remember where I was I was going with that um well how much control do you how much control exercise? well yeah. every humans have controlled land for for millions of years no probably a couple of millions years um 
that black forest in Germany that's been heavily manipulated, the Amazon basin, um, really it doesn't look it to the untrained eye, but heavily manipulated. Mm. So we've been doing it. Um, and there's always been this dilemma of, of how do you do it to benefit us without wrecking the place for all the other little things. And mm. the more populated we are, the more we need to manipulate things in our favor because there's nowhere on earth that where you can just leave leave things to nature and you can walk walk down the path and pick like capsicums and bananas and and the things that we need so you have to have to manipulate but in, in, in this kind of ethical way lovely thank you yeah. I'm giving you some very hard questions. I'm sorry. 